Hey everyone, Jono here. Last run we did the unthinkable. We beat the game with a ritual deck. Yes, you heard correctly, a ritual deck. With great joy and a sigh of relief, let's tick that category off the list. Now for this next run, I've needed to jump ahead and pick a type up front because Halloween is almost upon us. And some of you wanted to see zombies for Halloween. So how can I let the kids down? Let's give the kids their candy and get this Fright Night started with a type explanation. Let's maybe dial that music back while we're at it. Zombies are a very accessible type in this game. There are a total of 21 monsters, 15 of which are available to the player as early as the starting deck. 12 are unlocked as the story progresses, and 3 are locked behind the pocket station, unless you really want to do a ritual summon for Doku Rider. Recapping the rules, and boy, am I glad to see these again. Our deck must only consist of zombies. Trading and trade cloning are allowed, as well as the password trader. The story cannot progress until we've made a zombie deck, and all opponents must be dueled. Some of you have asked how I set my deck up before each run. When starting a game, if you run away from Simon, you're able to head back to the card shop and save your game. From there, exit to the main menu and do whatever you want with your deck before officially starting the story. Trading and free duels included. Which brings us to the start of the run. Instead of jumping directly into things, there are three strong zombies available to us already from none other than Duel Master K. For those of you that have never played this game, Duel Master K is an AI opponent that runs a mirror of your deck. Being a Konami game, Duel Master K's identity is based off Kazuhiro Miller. Having no dialogue, his presence in this game is to have us look deep in our souls and ask the big questions. Why are we here? Just to suffer? Well buddy, I already have. I just did a ritual run. And the roller coaster is still not over yet. After playing with ourselves repeatedly, we drop an armored zombie, a clown zombie, and a dragon zombie, which are going straight into our deck as the strongest cards for a good good while. With all things set up, here's our starting deck. It's a bit of a schmozzle, but it will have to do for now. Navigating back to our palace, we officially start the story with our questionable guardian, the blue Hamburglar. Oh, by the way, we've named ourselves Bones for this playthrough, keeping in line with the current theme. Being very enthusiastic to not have to play with a ritual deck again, I accidentally sped through my first hand a bit too fast. On my starting turn, I fused Graveyard and the Hand of Invitation with a zombie monster, resulting in the Snake Hair. Zombies as a card type are compatible with a large number of fusions across almost all types. Ten of them to be exact, including themselves. If you want to count those with dual types, you'll end up with 16. Which is pretty freaking accessible if you ask me, especially to a new player. Putting a pin in that, we attack Simon for game, and we win, a wretched ghost of the attic. And this of course took one try. Off to the dual grounds we go to meet up with our friends for some good old trick or treating. Here we have Tina dressed as a vampire. Very cursed and spooky indeed. Now from Tina all the way up to John 01, so long as we have a monster powered up to at least 1600 attack points, we win each duel. The exception being the last two villagers who have a 0.05% chance of summoning Gumo. I guess with me saying that, I sort of spoiled the next couple of duels, so I guess that little guessing game at the end shouldn't be too difficult for you all. But, you still have a chance to guess the card we win. And speaking of win, we're on to our final turn, no Raigeki this time, we attack with a 13th Grave, we attack with a Snake Hair, and attack for game with Clown Zombie. We won on Monster Eye, and this took one duel. Setting aside Nuzana over here, we face off against Villager 1, who's dressed as Popeye, and he's also a little too old to be trick-or-treating. As mentioned before, he should be pretty easy, so let's get back to our zombie analysis. Now, zombies are likely the first monster type new players use to figure out fusions. The core zombie fusions climb two levels, a base monster plus a zombie to give you a monster between 1000 to 1600 attack power, then that same zombie plus a plant to give you Pumpkin the King of Ghosts. There are also some bespoke zombie fusions that will always output a particular monster. I'll cover those in detail in another match, because we've reached the final turn. Attacking for game, and our prize is a beautiful headhuntress. With Popeye defeated, it's time we believe it and challenge Naruto to a duel. Getting back to the bespoke zombie fusions, any monster that is fused with Graveyard and the Hand of Invitation will result in the Snake Hair. Likewise, any zombie fused with Mammoth Graveyard will result in a Great Mammoth of Goldfine. You just need to make sure that the attack points of the fused monster are less than that of the Snake Hair and Great Mammoth of Goldfine respectively. Every other zombie fusion is based on attack power and a particular monster type. It's about that time of the duel where we reach the final turn. No Raigeki again this time, so we start whittling away at his monsters and attacking for game, and we're done. We win, da -da -da -da, a big eye, and this took one duel. 
Naruto Databayoing the frick out of here, we face off against Villager 3. No, he's not in costume, he's dead. Can't you see the halo? Dead. Give him a little more time and he'll start to look like the monsters in our deck. Dead. Getting back to the monsters, in my playtesting, zombies are the type that initiates the longest chain of fusions at 13 levels. The zombie type caps off at about 10 fusions and the remaining three resulted in monsters that were not zombie types. I'm actually really excited to show you the chain of this, but first we need to get rid of this old man. Let's ride Geki him out of the heavenly plane and attack the game. Da -da -da -da, we won a fire reaper. Perfect. We did this in one try and Tina has finally gotten herself ready to go trick or treating. But before that, let's show off the fusion chain. Starting off with the under 500 attack stats. A beast plus a zombie equals a shadow specter at 500 attack. Shadow specter plus a weak pyro equals fire reaper at 700 attack. Fire reaper plus a weak plant equals wood remains at 1000 attack. Plus a fish equals corroding shark at 1100 attack. Corroding shark plus a weak warrior equals zombie warrior at 1200 attack. Add a spellcaster and you get magical ghost at 1300 attack. Add another warrior and you end up with armored zombie at 1500. Mix in a weak dragon to get dragon zombie at 1600. Add back another zombie to make a Skelgon at 1700. Throw a plant on it and you finally get the Pumpkin King of Ghosts at 1800 attack, capping off all the zombies. From Pumpkin, add a dragon to get Cursed Dragon at 2000 attack, and fuse that with Gaia to make Gaia the Dragon Champion at 2600 attack. Finally, you take Gaia the Dragon Champion, add a Thunder, and you end up with Twin Headed Thunder Dragon at 2800 attack. All roads lead to Twin Head, and that is it for the 13 fusions. Back to the game. Tena has taken us to the town square, where everyone is out and about trick-or-treating. Peering off into the distance, we notice Jono being bullied by one of the local teenagers for having a suggestive Halloween suit. We confront the dragon-obsessed bully, and he runs away to his parents before we can do anything to stop him. Looking to cheer Jono up, we head back to the dual grounds and force him into a card game. Good dog. Jono is an easy opponent, given that the strongest card in his deck is Baby Dragon. So back to the zombie analysis we go. Jeez, there's a lot to cover with this. Zombies as a type gain a field spell advantage from the card Wasteland, and are not reduced by any other field types. Very handy, you'll see why I say that in later runs. The signature equipped card for zombies is Violet Crystal, which you've seen me use in prior runs a few times. At a glance thus far, I'd say this zombie deck is sharing many similarities with our dinosaur deck. Single card wise, the strongest cards are very close in power to each other, at 1500 and 1600 attack points respectively. As for the strongest cards in the arch types, Great Mammoth of Goldfine and Brachio Radius both cap at 2200 attack. I'd be curious to see how this run pans out in terms of difficulty. We'll hold off on that for now. We're on to our final attack. We attack the game and we win da -da -da -da, a Mountain Warrior, and this took one try, no doubt. Seto busts into the duel arena, looking to pick on more small children. Unfazed by this white rose over here, we challenge him to a duel. I apologize about the lawnmower in the background. I cannot control my neighbors, but hey. It's that time of year in Australia where you have to either start burning your grass or cutting it down to size. And I meant back burning, not that 420 stuff. Anywho, showcase just then was the fusion into Curse of Dragon. Streamlining the fusion steps, you can achieve a Curse of Dragon fusion with our current deck by using a dragon zombie followed by two other zombie monsters. For those that are unfamiliar with this game, the fusion result is dependent on the attack stat of its materials. Using a monster with higher attack will have the fusion output a card with higher attack if one exists. Prime example is Zombie Warrior and Armored Zombie. So long as one of your materials is over 1200 attack, you end up with an Armored Zombie. Speaking of things that will end up as zombies, we're onto the final turns of the duel. It's time to take a guess on how long this took and what card we're gonna drop. Summoning a monster, we attack, and then attack again. We won a Sparks. Having thoroughly defeated Seto, I get too lazy to edit the costumes on screen. So I leave the door grounds after saying bye to our friends. Ending our night of trick-or-treating, we return home and count our spoils. Thinking we're all in the clear, rumbling occurs outside and we are confronted by more teenage delinquents and their leader Haishin. Haishin has stolen all the candy in the palace and has threatened to beat all the residents with his magic stick. Biggity bouncing out of our room, Fish Sticks gets captured by Seto for not wearing a costume on Halloween. Back outside, we're confronted by the teenage bully once more, and our ethnic grandparent offers us some candy, completely ignoring the social tension in the room. Accuracy aside, we're confronted by Haishin, who challenges us to a duel. Now, I normally wipe to Haishin to speed up the story, but I'm curious to see if I can actually beat him with our current zombie deck. Haishin drops two of our much-needed zombie cards. 
those being Pumpkin the King of Ghosts and the Snake Hair. If we cannot defeat Haishin, Pumpkin is locked all the way onto Seto 2. Snake Hair at least drops by Banded Keith. And off to a stellar start we go, he drops a Great Moth, which is actually a good thing. 2600 is something definitely beatable, especially now that we dropped the Wasteland on the field. Now, I don't really give much of an analysis into Haishin 1's deck, but this is the state of play. The strongest cards in his deck comprise between 2800 attack and 3500 attack. In the spell and trap department, he has all the horrible disruptions you can think of. Widespread ruins, Raigekis, shadow spells, Megamorphs and Harpy's Feather Duster, just to name a few. Oh, he also has Exodia. That's real neat, isn't it? Our one saving grace, however, is that his AI isn't dialed up to 100 like the final six, at least in my experience. You'll know what sort of duel you're about to have based on his starting monster. In most cases, he will lead with his strongest monster. Everything else from that point will either equal its attack points or be lower. So long as you can take out that first card, you're home sweet. This duel sort of contradicts that, given that he summoned a twin-headed thunder dragon. This is likely because the AI drew that card from the top of its deck. You're not always in the clear. RNG is still your enemy. What is no longer our enemy is Haishin. We attack for game, and we win... Da -da 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 a Fire Reaper. Now instead of continuing with the story, we're going to grind against Haishin for a bit. Never thought those words would come out of my mouth for many reasons. Repeating this process close to 8 times, we ended up dropping Pumpkin and Snake Hair, so hooray for us. In the event we lost that matchup, we can fight him again in free duel. Anywho, getting back to the story, we need to lose to him, as it is a canon event, and I think we're a little sore from grinding. With Haishin refusing to accept our ethnic grandfather's food, he is forcefully held against his will and spoon-fed what's on the table. In doing so, we smash the plate. Oppa! Welcome to Purgatory. The rest of the encounter was a bit of a blur. Several wooden spoons were swung, and slippers were thrown at many heads. So let's advance the story via concussion. Waking up in today's reality, we're at another Yu-Gi-Oh tournament. According to the date, it seems to be YCS Santa Cruz de la Sierra in Bolivia. Hope I said that right. I don't know much about the TCG anymore, but a Mikanko Ken Gen deck topped, if that means anything to anyone. Gaining back control of our character, we proceed to save our game. I think this is the first save we've actually done in this playthrough. Hooray for us. First match of the tournament is Rex. He isn't too difficult given we just beat friggin' Haishin of all people. Now, I will note that I've forgotten to pick up another card from Haishin. That being Shadow Ghoul, another 1600 attack zombie. I'll go back and pick it up when I grind for cards. If we analyse our deck power wise, we should be all good all the way up until the final 6. In terms of power, I'd say we're almost equal to our dinosaur deck, albeit possibly slightly weaker based on how late we get Great Mammoth of Goldfine. Which FYI is an SA power rank from Labyrinth Mage or Seto 2, whichever comes first. Anywho number 3, yes I mentally kept count, but I'm math lexic so I'm pretty sure I've miscounted somewhere. We're treating the rest of this match like a game of Duels of the Roses. We're ganging up on our opponents with an army of Pump Kings. It's just as satisfying as this game as it was in the other. Speaking of satisfying, da -da 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 we got a Shadow who controls the dark. Nice. And we beat this first go. Our next duel is against the Bugman himself, Weevil. I'm conscious that until now, I haven't really been given much of an explanation to our current deck. So as I play through these easier decks, I'll rattle off some card trivia. I'm going to start chronologically in power. Our first card for analysis will be Graveyard and the Hand of Invitation. This card was released in the first booster pack in the OCG, and was never reprinted again. There is actually very little lore or trivia about this card, outside of what it does in games. Within Forbidden Memories, any zombie monster under 1500 attack that's fused with this card will result in the Snake Hair, which you've probably already seen me do a bunch of times. Despite being a vanilla monster in the physical card game, The Lost of the Roses gave this card an effect. When it's flipped face up, all of your monsters are transformed into zombies. As for its leader effects, it will give a boost to zombies and make a reduction against warriors. I think it was by 500 points, but I could be wrong. I'm not too familiar with Duelist of the Roses. Now that that's been wrapped up in a neat little package, it's time to get on to our final turn. Fusing a bunch of cards into the beast that is Skelgon, we attack into his Kuwagata Alpha, and we attack his life points with one Pumpkin, and attack his life points again with another Skelgon. We win a forest. And we did this in one try. On a completely unrelated note, I've lowered the speed of these duels to about 200%. I noticed in my ritual video that the duels were taking a bit longer, so I beefed it up, but that caused a bit of motion sickness, so I apologize about that. Anywho, number four, getting back to the game, we're up against our opponent, Mai. 
So long as we can hit over a Harpy's Pet Dragon at 2000 attack, we should be sweet for this duel. So time to listen to some more card trivia, being the good weebs that we are. The card we're focusing on this time is Zombie Warrior. Zombie Warrior is a fusion in the TCG between Skull 7 and Battle Warrior. The card debuted in the TCG in OTS Tournament Pack 1, which is pretty weird given that the pack came out in like 2016 when pendulums were running rampant. In Forbidden Memories, fusing a warrior and a zombie monster under 1200 attack will result in this card. As for the anime appearances, Yugi was about to summon this card against Pegasus before realizing that Pegasus knew each and every move he was about to make. It is at that point that he started blindly summoning monsters. Also something to note, this card and the 13th Grave share the same attack and defense points, the only difference being that Zombie Warrior is a fusion and 13th Grave is not. Anywho, it's Raigeki for the win and we attack for game. Gosh, I haven't said that in a while. The da 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 intensifies, and what do we win? We won a Marvelous. Marvelous. And we beat this first try. With my out of the way, it's on to our favorite cheater, Banded Keith. On paper, Banded Keith shouldn't be a problem, but we need to look out for his Zoa and a potential Metal Zoa. Having our zombies around 2700 attack is all that is needed, which is basically to equip cards, I guess. If we weren't successful in obtaining the Snake Hair from Haishin, Banded Keith has it in his B, C, D drop table. If we're able to A power rank him at least, he drops a Shadow Ghoul. I'll remember that for later in case we need to farm for it. Now we have drawn into a double Raigeki. That's like a double anywho right to the central lobe right here. I don't think I'll genuinely have enough time for a full card trivia, so I'll drop some serial box knowledge. Violet Crystal, the equip card we use for zombies, is actually compatible with a number of fiend monsters. The purple coloration is a color of mourning, which is likely why it works on zombies and some dark fiends. With the trivia out of the way, we're on to our last turn just as soon as Keith takes out our zombie with his fish. We activate a Raigeki for the win, and attack for game. We won! Da -da 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 and we got a blocker. And we did this in one try. With Bandit Keith defeated, it's time for the obligatory cutscene with Shardy. Shardy informs us that we had a past ancestor, and that past ancestor blacked out during his nighttime rounds of Millennium Trick or Treating. I have no idea whether ancient Egyptians had any concept of Halloween, but according to a Google search and a really sketchy Halloween tree fandom site, turns out they did. It was called a WAG Festival. Who knew? Staring blankly into the face of our ancestor, no words needeth be said. He hands us his Millennium American Express card and tells us to up its line of credit by pawning off whatever gold artifacts I can get my hands on in the modern era. Hmm. I wonder why the card says Simon Morin. Oh well, not my problem. Time to face off against Shardy and steal his Millennium Key. And he scales too while we're at it. Now remember kids, Shardy is an absolute pushover of a duelist. If you lose to him, you suck at this game, and you should immediately quit playing Yu-Gi-Oh. Well, here's playthrough number 5. Will I eat my words? Let's find out. But first, here's some card trivia. This time, we'll be looking at the card Magical Ghost. In Forbidden Memories, its summon can be achieved by fusing a spellcaster with a zombie monster, with an attack rating of both being under 1300. Magical Ghost debuted in the starter deck Yugi, and has not been reprinted since in the English TCG, unless you count it being reprinted again for the Speed Duel format. In that case, it was re-released in the Arena of Lost Souls pack, along with many other good zombie cards. From an anime perspective, this card has had zero anime appearances. Which is a bit of a cop-out for it, as all the other zombie cards surrounding it made it to the anime. Bones doesn't even have this card, so I wonder what happened there. Anywho, we're getting to our final turn. So we attack for game with our dragon zombie, and we win. Da -da 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 -da. We got a Miyatoko, and Shardy took one duel. Maybe next time, buddy. Oh, and we steal his stuff. Now we move on to Yami Bakura. Each time I duel Yami Bakura, I seem to have some very specific short-term amnesia. I completely forget how this guy structures his deck. Bakura focuses on defense over offense. Though he can fuse into strong monsters, his main tactic is getting out Millennium Shield and Labyrinth Wall, and the other noted monsters in his deck with about 2000 defense. This means that we'll need to beef up our monsters considerably to hit over 3000 attack. Adding back to the short term amnesia that I mentioned, I completely forget which equip cards go with which monster. Especially cards like the Snake Hair, which is only compatible with 3 equip cards. So expect to see me burn through a few cards unnecessarily. Sorry about that. But alas, we've managed to boost one of our cards to 2500 attack, which is plenty to take out everything else. Regardless, I'm not worried. You saw the Raigeki in my hand, and you know what we're going to do with that. 
Getting to our final turn, we activate Raigeki for the win, and we attack for game with all three of our monsters. Hooray for broken spell cards. Duh, 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 duh. We won a binding chain. Not my thing, but I won't kink shame. Stealing Bakura's stabby necklace, we go ahead and save our game. Oh, I've edited out the saving animation just to save some time. Our next opponent is the ooh man himself, Pegasus. Peggy is a noticeable increase from my last opponents, so if I draw into a wasteland, I am definitely going to use it, given that it can pull out a few heavy hitters like Media Black Dragon of all things. Keeping the card trivia train going, up next is Clown Zombie, a card I used in my initial deck to grind for the other zombie cards. Clown Zombie is the zombie counterpart of Christ Clown. Both have the same attack stat, but like all zombies, the defense has been reduced to zero. Clown Zombie is one of the signature zombie cards used by Bones in the anime against Joey. It made another key appearance in the Big Five Duel Monsters quest, alongside Armored Zombie and Dragon Zombie. In Forbidden Memories, Clown Zombie and Christ Clown have a bespoke fusion. If you fuse either one of those two cards with a reptile, it will result in Soul Hunter, a 2200 attack power fiend. And it can be any reptile. The strongest attack power amongst all the reptile cards is 1800. Not looking forward to that when I attempt that run. Getting back to the anime appearances, Clown Zombie has had a fair few inclusions in Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. This card is referenced a few times during the U-Bell arc, though it was mostly in flashbacks. This card is shown on screen during the explanations and recollections of Jaden's relationship with Yubel. This was also one of the cards used by Skull Knight in his duel against Axel Brody. By years they use that term loosely. He ended up sending it to the graveyard when he flipped up a magical merchant. Don't quote me directly, my memory's a bit spotty. But I digress. We are nearing the final turn of the duel, there's only 800 life points left. Time to guess how many times this took me. With a trusty Raigeki for the win, we attack for game. We win! Da, 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 da. We got a Fiend Reflection number 2, and this took one try believe it or not. It was looking a bit dicey for me, but I'm glad I pulled this off in one go. Up next is our favourite unnamed opponent. Not sure what I'll call her this time round, but based on the feedback from the plot device in our ritual video, I think Waifu is appropriate for most of you in the comment section. Like with every duel against her, you'll have an easier time if any of your monsters have a Pluto Guardian Star, as most of hers are Neptune. In our case, Skelgon has a Pluto type, which is neat. Given that we've met those requirements, I think I'll rattle off some card trivia. This time, we're looking at Armored Zombie. Armored Zombie can be achieved by fusing a one warrior monster with a zombie, so long as one of those is over 1200 attack. Alternatively, you can fuse Zanki with a spell card warrior elimination to get him. Since he is literally a zombie version of the card Zanki. And I guess it was kept that way in the anime, they never made it its own card, it simply came into being from Bones using Call of the Haunted to bring Zanki back from the graveyard. I think I'll cut things off there. This duel was surprisingly faster than I initially envisioned. Dispatching her monsters, we attack the game with Pumpkin and we win da -da 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 a baby dragon. And this took me one go. Stealing her necklace, we head back to the card shop and save our game. We have finally approached the last duel of the tournament, and this time it's against Kaiba. What did I say this time? It's always against Kaiba. Anywho, Kaiba humbled the ever-loving crap out of us in our ritual run. It took me 14, that's right, 14 duels to defeat him with a ritual deck. And for good reason. Having decent access to strong dragons, coupled with some very early disruptive spell cards, our strategy will need to be to hit hard and fast. Thankfully, in our first turn, I fire off a wasteland which will save me some time on equip cards. My deck is due for a revamp, but I'll have to revisit things later once I gain access to more cards. Unfortunately, that won't be till Seto 2. Our last piece of trivia before Egypt will be on the card, the Snake Hair. The Snake Hair is one of the bespoke zombie fusions in Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. Achievable by fusing any zombie monster under 1500 attack with Graveyard and the Hand of Invitation. Which you saw me do as early as the first duel of this game. If it wasn't entirely obvious from its appearance, the card is based off Medusa. With a very light card trivia out of the way, we're down to our final turn. We attack the game with Armored Zombie, and we win da -da -da -da, an, ac wow, an Acid Trap Hole. That's freaking handy. I just saved myself some S-Tech grinding for later. Stealing Kyber's Polished Gold Rod, we pawn off our Excess Gold and recharge their Millennium Annex cards. We decide to book a trip back to Egypt via some dark sorcery, courtesy of the old fella. Why no? I don't know what happened to your credit cards. Did you check the stairs? All three million of them? Uguang out of existence, we walk through the door and wind up back in Egypt. 
Normally, I head straight for Sedin right now to unlock the mages, but learning from my mistakes in my prior run, I'm going to head to the Duel Arena up front to take on Jono and Tina. Entering the old Duel Arena, we can see that the place has been trashed and all semblance of candy has been stolen. Fairy Jono invites us to the new secret trick or treating location where all the remaining kids are dividing up their last remaining candies. No time for snacks, it's time to play a card game. Jono 2's main threat is Red Eyes Black Dragon. Aside from that, he may pull out a twin headed Thunder Dragon if you're not lucky. Kicking this duel off with a Wasteland should be all that is needed to get the upper hand. So with that being said, it's time for some card trivia. This time, I'm going with Dragon Zombie. In Forbidden Memories, this card is obtainable by fusing a zombie and a dragon, so long as the attack rating is under 1700 attack. Any higher, and you'll probably end up with either a Skelgon or a Curse of Dragon. It also has some bespoke fusions. Fusing a Crawling Dragon with a Dragon Capture Jar spell card will also result in Dragon Zombie. Additionally, fusing a Twin Long Rods 2 with Graveyard in the Hand of Invitation will also result in this card. Strangely, don't know how. If you haven't already realized, this card is the zombie version of Crawling Dragon. As for anime appearances, this card featured in the duel between Bones and Joey. This card was the result of Crawling Dragon being brought back to life by Call of the Haunted. Anywho number 6, it's about that time again. We ride Geki for the win, and attack for game. We win, da 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 da, a secretary and a secrets, and this took one try. With Jono defeated, it's time for Tina 2. I feel the need to recap this since it screwed me over during my ritual video. Tina can only be challenged whilst less than two mages have been defeated. If you defeat any more, the Seto 2 cutscene will occur, and she will not duel you for the remainder of the playthrough. You'll need to go through an entire New Game Plus cycle again in order to have another chance. When you do get the opportunity to duel her, she is fortunately rather weak. A pumpkin is all that is needed for her, but I kicked off a wasteland just to be on the safe side. So onto the card trivia we go. The card trivia for this duel will be Skelgon. In Forbidden Memories, it is obtainable by fusing a dragon with a zombie, having an attack rating over 1600. Anything less and you will end up with a dragon zombie. In the anime, Skelgon appears in Episode 1 inside Kaiba's briefcase when he attempts to make a trade with Yugi's grandpa. Nothing else apart from that. In the TCG, this card got short printed in Astral Pack 5 and has never been released again. <laughs> wow, we've almost exhausted our entire deck. Or at least our deck thus far. Getting back to the duel, we're on to our final turn. With a trusty Rageki in the hand, you know what we do. Drop it for the win, and attack for game. One, two, and three. We win! Da -da 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 and we got a Sinister Serpent, and this took one try. With that entire ordeal over and done with, it's time to save our game. Being thoroughly enraged with how Haishin's teenage gangs have been treating all the trick-or-treaters, we head over to the local Bunnings to pick up some supplies to improve the security of the neighborhood. Being greeted by the doorman, before loaning us some tools and supplies, he wants to see our plans, out of concerns that we're about to Macaulay Culk in the neighborhood. Returning back to our seemingly empty palace, we are challenged by a visually impaired man who has wandered into our place of residence. Classic Egypt right here. On that note, I wonder if card companies have figured out a way to make cards accessible to the blind. It's technically doable, with like braille markers and stuff, but I think with a game like Yuga it'd be very difficult to implement. Could you imagine converting a Nirvana High Paladin into Braille? At this point, just print the card on 80 grit sandpaper to save your time. Jeez. Still, it's a bit of a cop-out to use. But at least you never have to hear the word judge screamed out at every YCS tournament. Based on that alone, it's probably better that you avoid this toxic mess of a card game. Now, Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. For all its faults, it is a big chef's kiss in terms of simplicity. For those that have never played the card game, this is not how it actually plays. Forbidden Memories mimics the behavior of the anime, where there's no effects whatsoever. At least for the first season. The one thing, however, they have encapsulated perfectly is Raigeki. Raigeki for the win and we attack for game, that is exactly how it works in the card game, even till this day. Gotta love it. We won a Majin Jin, and this took one try. Obtaining the plans off the floor, we head back to Bunnings and walk straight into the Trade Center. Strolling through the store, we find out that Seto works here and has heard all about our plans for the neighborhood. He sheepishly tells us that the candy Hashin stole has been distributed amongst various hoodlums in the neighborhood. We are now faced with a moral dilemma. $200 for a petrol chainsaw and face mask, or $200 for some fencing. I think the decision is obvious. Guess we're going with option one. Don't worry kids. The chainsaw's an Azito. It is perfectly safe. You'll find electric razors have more cutting power than this thing. Speaking of things lacking in power, it's time to challenge the Desert Shrine. 
I've picked this shrine intentionally for the field advantage. I will say that our deck is a bit lacking in attack power for some of the mages we're about to face. Anyone that is capable of summoning a gate guardian is probably going to be problematic for us. Though I don't need to worry about that right now. The current goal is to defeat two mages so we can kick off the cutscene with Seto 2. The thing I'm going to start finding a bit problematic as you've probably seen in other duels is the equip card compatibility. Though I have strong monsters, a lot of them are only compatible with about 3 equip cards out of the total set in my deck. This is going to slow things down a little bit. All of our zombies are compatible with Violet Crystal, and for most of them, Dark Energy as well. From then on, things start to differ. Black Pendant, which you just saw on screen there, is compatible with the Snake Hair and Pumpkin the King of Ghosts. Wish I remembered that before I started fusing. Beast Fangs is compatible with every monster in our deck, except for Armored Zombie. As for Malevolent Nuzla, that's only going to work on Pumpkin, Skelgon, and Armored Zombie. With all those combinations, how can I not get tripped up? At this point of the duel, I get frustrated. I'm quite literally running down my deck till I get a Raigeki so I can attack the game. It's a very crappy strategy, but it's a strategy nonetheless. Speaking of Raigeki, a few of you in the comments have actually asked me for merch. I don't quite know what to do with that information. Heck, I'd love to do it, but I don't know the logistics being based out in Australia. I'd love to make you all field centers or even orikas of the Raigeki card. I just don't know any service that can dropship it out to all of you. And even then, don't really like the concept of dropshipping. But I digress. Finally drawing the Raigeki we need, we blow up our opponent's field and attack the game. Hooray! Da -da 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 -da. We won a winged cleaver, and we beat this on our first try. With the lower mage down, it's onto the high mage of disappointment. Hey you mass prick, give us back the candy, is what I would have said if I wasn't severely introverted. Instead, I'm going to nicely challenge him to a card game and wager it as part of our duel. I mean, it's not like we have anything to intimidate him with. Our chainsaw is basically a vibrating butter knife. But I guess that's what happens when you don't have the budget for a steel. Or a Husqvarna for that fact. If any sponsors want to change my narrative, I welcome all feedback through cash. Anywho number 7. Mardis has actually summoned his strongest vanilla monster, that being Summon Skull. Everything else in his deck is actually weaker in terms of raw attack power. They simply just get boosted by Wasteland to hit over Summon Skull. We'll be going tit for tat in this duel, so it's time for some trivia. This time we'll be focusing on Pumpkin the King of Ghosts. Pumpkin can be summoned in Forbidden Memories by fusing a plant with any zombie over a thousand attack. This card debuted in the TCG within the Metal Raiders pack as a common card, and has not been reprinted since. In the anime, this was the signature card used by Bones against Joey. In some BS anime logic, Yugi said this card could not be revived by Call of the Haunted, so Bones lost the duel thanks to this random ass technicality. Pumpkin is allegedly the father of Pump Princess, the Princess of Ghosts, which came out 9 years later in the Shadow Spectres pack. I think we covered off all monsters in the Bones episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! But enough of that for now. We attack the game with our boosted Shogun, and we win, blah blah blah, battle locks. And this took, say it with me kids, one duel. Given our deck has the ability to pull out a dragon, that being Cursed Dragon, I thought we'd try our luck at challenging the Mountain Shrine. The Nathan Cleary Shrine is the second strongest shrine out of all of them, with the top one being the Meadow. That ranking is based on the raw attack power of the monsters they can bring out. In the case of High Major Tenza, we need to watch out for Twin Headed Thunder Dragon, Meteor Black Dragon, and Black Skull Dragon. Now, I was going to cover off some trivia, but I've actually exhausted all of the zombie cards in my deck. There are definitely other zombie cards that we can look over for this game, but you won't actually get to see them for the remainder of this playthrough. I will however be going out of my way to unlock more cards after Seto 2, so we'll be able to swap out and include 3 new monsters into our deck, and 3 new sets of trivia. Once those are also exhausted, I'll come up with something fun to keep things interesting. If all else fails, I guess I could always read every single card out in Greek. You know, since there actually aren't any Greek cards, yet they still manage to translate that entire language for all the video games. But I digress. We are actually nearing the last few turns of the duel. Tagging out to our opponent, he pulls a cheeky move and takes out my pumpkin. Not fun. I like that guy. But never fear, we have a Raigeki, and we use it for the win and attack the game. We won! Da -da 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 -da. We got a deep sea shark. And this took one duel to complete. Up next we have High Major Tenza. Now if this guy was hoarding candy, you'd be pretty suspect as to what is actually stuffed into that candy. Anywho number 8, I've actually realised that I've missed a card from our trivia set. That card being the 13th Grave. 
In Forbidden Memories, it is a standalone card, i.e. you cannot fuse to make it. Its attack stats is identical to Zombie Warrior, but as a monster, it is the counterpart to Skull Servant and the Wandering Doomed. By counterpart, it's simply another weird way of saying it's another freaking skeleton. The 13th Grave debuted in the Legend of the Blue Eyes White Dragon booster pack, and has since not been reprinted. Its number in the set, ironically, was 13 as well. So take with that what you will. This card also made an appearance in the anime, howbeit much later, during episode 109. It was featured in the duel between Duke Devlin and Nesbit, and I think Serenia was there as well. Fun fact about Nesbit, his wife actually features in another show. Hold up, let me put up a picture of Mrs. Nesbit. Damn, somebody's punching above their weight. Now it's becoming abundantly clear that my deck needs a refresh. I'm thankful that I drew a decent enough hand to power up Armored Zombie, but things are only going to get more difficult from here. I'm not going to resort to S-Tech grinding just right now, I'll be doing that before the final 6. I like to avoid trying to get cards like Megamorph for as long as possible, just to give these decks a chance to showcase what they're actually capable of. Unrelated, if I sound a bit more monotone than normal, it's because I'm likely recording this segment in the early morning before my work meetings. I'm not a morning person, and I'm only actually able to commit one hour to these videos a day, that's why they take so long. What doesn't take long is Raigeki. Firing one of those off, we attack for game, and we beat a Tenza. We won a Skull Red Bird, and this took one try. Stealing a candy necklace from the weird Hokage, we make our way back to the Duel Arena to check in on the locals. I wonder what they've been up to while I've been out scaring teenagers with a chainsaw. Entering the Duel Arena, a very frazzled Jono runs up to us. It appears that Haishan has gone full water noose and has been kidnapping children. Where the heck are the parents in this game? Entering the shrine, we encounter the dollar store version of Odeon. Looking for some gummy bears, he challenges us to a duel. Labyrinth Mage may prove to be a challenge for us. His deck is stacked towards summoning Gate Guardian, the Gate Guardian pieces, and Twin Headed Thunder Dragon, which is not fun for us at our current power level. Our rewards for defeating him, however, are pretty great for this run. Instead of battling Seto 2, we can challenge Labyrinth Mage instead to reward ourselves with a great mammoth of gold fine. Oh, there it is, right on cue. Couldn't have timed that more perfectly. Yes, he will drop that card for us if we pull off an S or an A power rank. Additionally, he can also reward us with a Shadow Ghoul, a card I couldn't be bothered to obtain from Bandit Keith, but it's a 1600 attack zombie, which is going to be pretty useful for us right now. Oh, what I had also neglected to mention, Labyrinth Mage also has a number of defensive monsters, those being Labyrinth Wall and Millennium Golem, which you can see on screen. They're going to slow us down, but that's okay. More than likely, I'll just stack my field up with strong monsters and drop a Raigeki on the last minute. It's a bit of a cheesy strategy, but that's what he gets for stalling us out. The more important question in the back of my mind is whether our deck is actually capable of pulling off an A or an S power rank against this guy. For those that need help calculating ranks, Hippo-chan has re-uploaded her rank calculator to speedrun.com about a fortnight ago. It's a pretty handy tool. Alternatively, you can try the older tool on Teo Online. Apologies, I don't know who owns that one. With our cheese strat finally taking effect, it's Raigeki for the win, and we attack for game. We won, people. Da -da 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 and we obtained a Zaragun. And we beat this on our first try. With Labyrinth Mage down, we're able to farm for Great Mammoth of Goldfine. Purposely picking the wrong direction in the maze will lead you to another encounter with Labyrinth Mage. We're going to rinse and repeat this method for as many times as it takes until we get Great Mammoth of Goldfine. Take a guess as to how many duels this one took me. <laughs> Geez, I understand why people play the 15 card mod of this game. Anywho, time to exit the Labyrinth. I was curious as to how the Labyrinth Mage kept meeting us at every wrong turn, so I drafted a map for how I think the maze is structured. It seems fairly accurate as far as I'm concerned. I should become a cartographer. Exiting the maze, we confront Haishin, Seto, and some guy who are holding Tina captive. Seto is eager to show her that lowest prices are just the beginning, but before that, he challenges us to a duel. Before we get too stuck into things, we edit our deck to add in the single Great Mammoth of Goldfine we won from Labyrinth Mage. Oh, and during the process I also won a Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon. Shame we can't use it. Seto 2 is a decent increase in power from Labyrinth Mage. His heaviest hitters are Gate Guardian, Meteor Black Dragon, and Black Skull Dragon. The rest of his deck is filled with other 3000 attack monsters, as well as the Gate Guardian pieces as well. This is the key reason why I grinded for Great Mammoth of Goldfine with a Labyrinth Mage instead of this guy. As a precaution, very fortunate, I triggered off a Wasteland at the start of the turn. I'm fairly certain this is going to be the crutch for me this duel. 
I don't think I have enough equip cards to hit over his heaviest hitters. On top of that, I only have one copy of Great Mammoth of Goldfind. I don't think I'm going to be able to pull it out of my deck. Unless we go for a repeat of the starting duels with my Sea Serpent deck. Gosh, I'm so glad that that runs over. Thankfully, it's Pumpkin the King of Ghosts to the rescue, as always. Since his strongest cards at the moment are Metal Zoa, I'm not expecting to face anything over 3500 attack. Unless we get really unlucky with the top deck. Let's also not forget, Seto also has both Raigeki and Crush card. He can definitely flip the tides on us in this duel, but at this point in time, I'm thinking we got him covered. Let's just hope for no cheeky Gate Guardian summons. I'm only on 1500 attack points, and getting a direct hit from one of those is not ideal. Something worth noting, which is a bit of a risk for this run, if I lose to Seto 2, all that grinding I did with Labyrinth Mages has to be done all over again. Really risking it for the biscuit this time. Anywho, we've attacked for game, and we beat Seto. We won a Silver Fang, and this took one try. Group hugs all around. Um, mate, why did you take your clothes off? Yep, still naked. I guess we're just going to roll with this then. Saving our game, I'm going to take a quick detour and collect all the remaining zombie cards. Just before we tackle the rest of the mages. This is what version 2 of our deck looks like. Gaining back control, we exit to the overworld and challenge the forest shrine. The forest mage should be relatively easy, so long as we can get a monster close to 2800 attack. The strongest card in this deck by far is Jirai Guma at 2200 attack, which gets boosted to 2700. Aside from that, everything sits around 2000, so we're going to be contending with monsters around 2500 attack. Safe to say, given our starting hand, our 3600 attack dragon zombie beater is more than what's needed to take this guy out. And I can finally use Great Mammoth of Goldfine, now that I've farmed 3 copies of it. In my infinite stupidity, I haven't actually recorded down what equip cards are compatible with Great Mammoth. Looks like I forgot to save that document, so forgive any screw ups along the way. Now I've just realised we're on our last turn. Attacking for game with our two mammoths, we bring down the forest mage. We won a morphing jar. Jar run when? Forest mage goes down in first try, and we make our way over to Anabesius. Now this got me wondering, why did they stick Anabesius in the forest and Martis in the desert? You'd think this guy would be glued to a pyramid or something. Anywho number 10, our biggest challenge with Anabesius are his great moth cards. At our current level, him summoning a perfectly ultimate great moth is enough to take us out unfortunately. Our best strategy is to change the field. Like so. We summon out a very healthy looking pumpkin, and we start whittling away at his life points. Time to pick up where we left off with our Great Mammoth analysis. On paper, Great Mammoth of Goldfine is compatible with Dark Energy, Beast Fangs, Violet Crystal, and of course Mega Morph and Bright Castle. I need to remember that for my next duels, but likely I won't. Thankfully looking at that card, that's one more extra equip card we get to play around with when you compare this card to Brachioradius in our dinosaur run. We are on to our last turn, and this duel seemed to have gone off without a hitch. With our trusty Raigeki for the win, we attack the game with Skelgon. Da -da 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 -da, we won a Goki Ball, and this took one try. We steal the key to this guy's gumball machine, and retrieve all the lost candy he's pilfered from us so far. Hopping on a boat, we visit Darts' lair, oh sorry, I meant the Ocean Shrine, and throw hands with the first life card that spots us. How dare you sit up there in that high chair, you think you're better than me? Short answer is no. The strongest card in Ocean Mage's deck is Roaring Ocean Snake, which on this field gets powered up to 2600 attack. He also has a man-eating black shark at the same attack power. Aside from that, everything else, eh, it's going to be pushing 2500. So long as we throw one equip card on a Great Mammoth of Goldfine, I'm pretty sure we'll be sweet. In an absolute middle finger activity, this bozo pulls out a twin-headed thunder dragon. I am actually in some trouble here. But thankfully I have a trusty wasteland to knock it down a peg. Wow, that doesn't sound good. It is legitimately thunderstorming where I am right now, which is pretty fitting for these sort of duels. Seeing as this guy has no chance with me in the game world, he's trying to attack me directly through the real world. Not happening buddy. This isn't Duel Masters Kaijudo Showdown. Monster attacks do not work that way. Time to continue the analysis for Great Mammoth of Goldfine. In Forbidden Memories, Great Mammoth of Goldfine can be obtained by fusing a zombie with Mammoth Graveyard. The card itself was named in honour of the 4Kids co-producer Lloyd Goldfine, who helped bring the Yu-Gi-Oh! series to North America. Its name in the OCG is Golden Demon Elephant. 
which they had to change during localization to avoid any religious connotations. We have actually reached the last turn of the duel. Clearing out his Seeking Dragon, we attack with Skelgon and attack with Dragon Zombie for game. Da -da 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 we won a Turtle Raccoon, and this took one duel to accomplish. Defeating the lower lifeguards, we storm the tower and take on Sekmeton. More like Sekmet on these nuts, bro. Sorry, couldn't help it. It's like a reflex at this point. Hoping I'll grow out of it soon. Changing his field from water to wasteland, we've hopefully stopped Sekmeton's heaviest hitters. That being Crab Turtle, the most godly card in all of existence. Let's continue on the trivia for Great Mammoth of Goldfine. In the TCG, this card debuted in Legendary Collection 4, Joey's World Mega Pack, and has been reprinted in Ghost from the Past, The Second Haunting. Before I continue with the trivia, I have inadvertently screwed myself over. I have powered up this guy's Labyrinth Wall. I didn't even know he had a Labyrinth Wall. And despite my efforts, he still summons the god against us, and he takes out one of our pumpkins. Truly a fearsome creature indeed. Getting back to the trivia, Great Mammoth of Goldfine has three counterparts, those being Mammoth Graveyard, Zombie Mammoth, and Last Task Mammoth. Regarding anime appearances, Great Mammoth appeared in episode 79. Bone used this card against his duel with Yami Bakura, using polymerization. In Yu-Gi-Oh GX, in the episode 11 of the dub, the flashback shows Cyrus mentioning that Jaden took this card from him, though it's actually not displayed on screen. What is displayed on screen, however, is me kicking the crap out of this mage. We're on to about, I'm going to say our final turn. We're going to beef up a pumpkin and start attacking his monsters. I think if my math is right, we have just enough to take him out. Attack for 3-6. Oh yeah, we have more than enough. <laughs> Whoops. We won. Da -da 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 and we got a wing egg of new life. And this took one try. Stealing the old man's candy necklace. Our collection of recovered candies have increased. Now on to our final shrine. Up next is the Meadow Mage, and he is bloody annoying. If you're noticing that my deck looks slightly different, there is a reason for that. I'll explain it later. Anywho, number 11. Low Mage's strongest card is Judge Man, which gets powered up to 2700 attack on a Meadow Field. Its Guardian Star is Sun, which gives it a 500 attack point boost against our monsters. Meadow Mage has a decent variety of Guardian Stars amongst his strong monsters, which can come back to bite you if you're not paying attention. He can also slow down the duel with Swords of Revealing Light if you let things run out for too long. Whilst we chip away at this guy, let's have some trivia. This time the focus will be on Ghoul with an Appetite. This card is the counterpart to Gate Deeg. By counterpart, we mean a close copy and paste. Though I will say Gate Deeg seems to have a bit more detail than this guy. As far as releases go, this card has not been released in the TCG. Instead, it was released in the OCG as part of the 7th booster pack and has not been reprinted since. In terms of anime appearances, there are none. It's one of those early Yu-Gi-Oh cards that didn't make much of an impact outside of it being released in a booster pack. It did however feature in Tag Force 7 as one of the opponents. That wraps things up. Let's get back to the duel. And I am getting my absolute butt kicked. Finally putting off a wasteland, I have a chance to at least attack back into the opponent. Unfortunately, it wasn't a Millennium Shield. And that Wasteland we used? Yeah, a bit short-lived. I'm on 800 life points. <laughs> but thankfully, I have enough equipped cards to hit back with the Pumpkin. Let's just hope he doesn't summon anything stronger than what we have. Well, so far so good. Out of sheer paranoia, I decided to throw a few more equipped cards into the Pumpkin. Even though I'm pretty sure at this point he has nothing else that can take me out. Not wanting to waste time, we're going to fire off a Raigeki to clear his field and start attacking his life points directly. And response? Defense mode, we're good. We got this. At least I think we do. Skell gone, plus that, plus that. Yep, definitely, we got this. Finally. Attacking his monster and attacking again for game, we defeated the Meadow Mage and we won da -da, a Shadow Spectre. And believe it or not, this took me two duels. I didn't do this first try. Which is why the deck that I used against Meadow Mage looks a bit different. I completely forgot to put back the cards that I grinded for. Oh well, on to High Mage Kapura. Now we sort of skipped right into the door so I didn't get much time into the lore explanation. But Kapura stole our candy. Where is he keeping it? In his freaking stomach. So safe to say we're not going to get anything back after defeating this guy other than the satisfaction of victory. And in an ultimate big brain move, I have also forgotten once more to put the new cards back in the deck. There is no Great Mammoth of Goldfine, 
There is no Shadow Ghoul, there is no Ghoul with an appetite. Forgotten completely. My bad. However, we seem to be doing okay. Having Kapura lead with Sayaro indicates to me that he doesn't have any other strong monsters in his deck. Which is really great for us because I cannot be bothered to deal with a Gate Guardian right now. Recommendation for dueling the Meadow Shrine? Put your cards in something other than Moon. Don't do what I do and forget and stuff myself up. But I'm not worried. We seem to be having a much better time with High Mage Kapura than what we did with a Low Meadow Mage. Even with the weaker deck that we're running. Given we're on our last mage, let's finish off the card trivia. We're going to focus on Shadow Ghoul, and gosh, there is a crap load of trivia on this guy. I think I'll need to spread things out during the final 6. Anywho 12, Shadow Ghoul is a standalone monster in Forbidden Memories, having no cards that can fuse into it. When the video game shifted to Doors of the Roses, Shadow Ghoul was able to convert itself into a wall shadow if it moved over a labyrinth space. It is also one of the only few monsters in the game that can actually travel over that terrain. Very handy to have in your back pocket. I'll stop things there, given that we're on our final turn. With a Rageki for the win, and an attack for game, High Mage of Fatness goes down. Da -da 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 we want a giant soldier of stone, and this took one duel. Stealing a random piece of ornament from his house, we have now defeated all the mages. Before we go ahead and challenge the final six, we're going to need to do some card grinding. Already getting a head start with Acid Trap Pole, we farm a widespread ruin off Waifu, Bright Castle off Pegasus, and Megamorph off Pegasus. Now there are definitely other cards that we could use, but I think these three are the only ones that are needed. Version 3 of our deck looks like this. The key cards we subbed in are Megamorph and Bright Castle, and for good measure we've slotted in two widespread ruins. And that's about it. We'll see if having no Harpy's Feather Dust has bites me in the butt. Back to the story. We make our way to the Vast Shrine, eagerly looking forward to defeat Haishan and reclaim our top tier Halloween candy. Seto has finished his shift at Bunnings and he's keen to help us stick it back to Haishan, for some reason. Onward through those big doors we go. Entering the Teenage Hideout, we are faced with Teenage Security. Generic Gang Member 1 and Generic Gang Member 2. Time to challenge them to a duel. As you all know, these next few duels will be played on the Dark Field. I think it's stupid that zombies are not powered up by Dark, especially given that the equip card Dark Energy works on almost all zombie cards. Oh well, can't do much about that now. In order to win against our next two opponents, we need to summon a monster over 3000 attack. That's it. So with no further strategy in mind, let's continue the trivia. Shadow Ghoul as a monster has no counterparts. Rather, it had retrains and features itself in other cards, those being War Shadow and Ghoul of the Labyrinth. Before Konami took over Yu-Gi-Oh, there was also a Bandai version of this card, which was colored pink and had different stats. There definitely is a lot of love for this card. I'm surprised they haven't made a Labyrinth archetype. Oh well, one can only dream. I'll pause the trivia for now. Let's get back to the duel. Sebek seems to be really good at throwing out almost every Metal Zoa he has in his deck. Like I said before with the strategy, summon something stronger than 3000 attack and you win. Our shiny big gold mammoth seems to do pretty well at that. Shout out to you Skull Mammoth Mon, you absolute beast. Getting to our final turn, it's about that time again. It's Rageki for the win and we attack for game. Sebek goes down and we want a flame ghost. I'm going to continue the trend from our ritual video and not tell you how many tries it took me to beat the final six. At least until I finish the game. We're now up against our second obstacle. Like we said before, same strategy as Sebek, summon a monster over 3000 attack. Except in this case, bump that up by 150 attack points, as this guy's strongest card is Skull Knight, which boosted on dark makes it 3150 attack. Sorry, my brain just froze there trying to do quick math. Time for part 3 of the trivia. This time we focus on the TCG. Shadow Ghoul debuted in Metal Raiders and was reprinted again in Dark Beginnings 2, Legendary Collection 4, and the Speed Duel GX pack, Midterm Paradox. Unlike its effects in Forbidden Memories and Doors of the Roses, Shadow Ghoul's actual effect in the TCG is that it gains 100 attack for each monster in your graveyard. I think I'll stop things there for this duel. Getting to our final turn, we have cleared away his side of the field, and we attack for game with Ghoul with an appetite. We win, da -da 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 -da, and we got a Witty Phantom. Not needed. That's both Sebek and Neku down. This is it. We are done with all the lackeys. It's time to get everyone's candy back from this Jafar costume hoodlum. It is around here that our zombie deck will be put to the test. Haishan boasts some beefy beefcake monsters, namely Gate Guardian, Meteor Black Dragon, Black Skull Dragon, and a bunch of other cards around 3000 attack, some of which get boosted by this field. The Cape Crusader also has Rageki, Megamorph, and Widespread Ruin available to him, 
which is not going to be that fun to deal with when he sets it in his back row. Our strategy will be to rely on a Mega Morph to beef up a monster over 4000 attack and sacrifice whatever else we have left to trigger his trap cards. As a plan B, there's always Wasteland. But for the remainder of this duel, I think my pumpkin is more than enough, unless he pulls out a Raigeki to stop me. Let's get our final piece of trivia out of the way. Don't worry, it'll be a short one. Shadow Ghoul is one of the several cards that lacks a passcode in the bottom left corner of the card. Its card artwork was taken directly from Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist Duel 34, Death Trap Dungeon, specifically the panel in the manga which shows this monster getting fused into Labyrinth Wall. That's basically the manga version of the duel against the Paradox Brothers. And that's it. We are out of trivia, and Haishin goes down. We won a Masked Sorcerer, and we can finally reclaim all the children's lost candy. Being highly impressed with our win, Seto holds up the candy bag in the air like a severed head and rushes us out of the shrine. Seto smirks and reveals the true nature of his plan. He had intentionally baited Haishin into stealing all the kids' candy so he can swipe it out from underneath him. In his attempt to at that, he plans to open up his own candy store, artificially inflating the market due to supply shortages. This is a government level move if I ever saw one. Taking candy from babies, literally. How dare he? We cannot let this teenager roam free. We need to beat him in the card game. Simply because the game won't let me chop his legs off with a chainsaw I bought. Jumping straight into the door, we fire off a wasteland. We seem to have great RNG against Seto since he put down a trap instead of a heavy hitter. With our luck continuing, it seems that he summoned a gate guardian instead of a blue eyes ultimate dragon. I am fairly certain he does not have any of those in his deck. So it looks like we'll have a decent run at this duel. To force him into summoning weaker monsters, we're going to fire off a Regeki straight away. Also because I have nothing else that can take Gate Guardian out at this stage. Now that we've finally drawn a Mega Morph, we're going to beef up our Pumpkin to be around 4200 attack. Now that we are in a dominant position against this AI, there's a chance that he could fire off a Crush card, Regeki or Shadow Spell. But fortunately, as RNG and luck would have it, he doesn't. That face down card right there should be a War Shadow, so we have enough opportunity to stall for time. As a precaution, I'm going to feed my Pumpkin a few more equip cards, just in case he top decks a Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. That face down attack position card is definitely a Gate Guardian. I'm going to speed things up by firing off another Raigeki, and then bait his next few attacks into some weaker monsters. Well, actually we don't need to do that. He's left his monster in attack mode. That is likely a Blue Eyes White Dragon. We won. 3300 damage, Seto 3 goes down, and the card we got was Lord of the Lamp. Having finally put an end to this chaotic teenager, Haishin sneaks up behind us and tries to steal our kill. Look, I'm all for vigilante violence, but I'm wearing some very nice white shoes and I'd rather not have blood spatter all over him. Jafar Haishin is very pissed off that a bunch of youths have stolen his stash of candy. Using a Millennium phone booth, he calls his dad. Da -da, da -na -na. Jafar Haishin has called forth his dad, Jafar Thriller Jackson. Being annoyed with his son shenanigans, he banishes him to a pocket dimension, and promptly locks the door via fire. Looking to punish the remainder of the children, we tell him that we're an adult because we have several credit cards, ignoring the fact that we stole them off our older relative. Not being satisfied, he challenges us to a card game. If he wins, we need to give up, go home, and go to our room. Now Dark Knight is meant to be an easy opponent. Reason being is that the strongest card in his deck is a Media Black Dragon. What he does to compensate for this, is throw a bunch of Mega Morphs onto his monsters. This is not fun. Our hand is looking very scarce, so we need to start dumping some monsters. The goal is to get another Mega Morph so we can power up our Great Mammoth of Goldfine to match his attack points. Because we're just shy of 100 to be able to hit over him. And there we go. Even better. Mega Morph and two equip cards, we are now able to hit over him. But I can't get too trigger happy yet. That face down card has me worried. I am highly suspicious that it is a widespread ruin. So to pop it, I'm going to sacrifice a monster. But just to ensure I'm not incorrect, I'm still going to power it up with various equip cards. Let's see if my hunch was right. There we go. Granted I wasted two equip cards, but that is much better than losing our Great Mammoth. Dark Knight responds by setting another trap card. Sorry, Jafar Thriller Jackson. Attacking with Dragon Zombie, turns out it was a bluff. This was the exact reason why I beefed up my attack points. Now the card he set is likely a Gate Guardian or a Black Skull Dragon. Just as a precaution, I'm going to set a Raigeki just in case things go pear shaped for me. I should be ready to one turn kill by the next turn if all goes well. Okay, we're looking good. That sun is definitely a Blue Eyes White Dragon. Triggering off our set Raigeki, we decide to fire it off and attack for game with both our Great Mammoth and our Pumpkin. We beat Dark Knight Jafar Thriller Jackson. 
Da -da -da -da, we got a Blackland Fire Dragon. Being shaken up by his defeat, he calls on his wife to step in and finish what he started. Meet Mrs. Jafar Thriller Jackson. And boy is this guy punching. We are finally up against our final duel of the game. Thankfully, we don't have to contend with any spell and trap cards. Unthankfully, we have to deal with Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. Come on, come on, come on. It's a moon, it's a Black Skull Dragon. We are looking good. What a hand we just pulled. This final six RNG is freaking mental. If you hear me talk about RNG, that stands for random number generation. The game generates a random string of numbers called a seed. Each seed corresponds to a specific drop table and card draw for everyone in the game. Yourself and opponents included. In our circumstances, it appears we've hit a seed number that corresponds to Dark Knight, Nightmare and Seto 3, not drawing Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragons. At least for this run through of the gauntlet. The seed changes based on a number of in-game factors, but I don't know enough to explain it. So instead, let's watch this 3D duel. With an explosion of fire, Nightmare's final monster is down, and we attack with our dragon zombie. Game is over, we won. Having truly defeated everyone in this game, we now can claim all the candy for ourselves and disperse it amongst our friends. We exit the vast shrine and sit atop of our candy throne. Play that wind music, we've freaking earned it. Time for the run wrap up. We took a total of 40 duels in the campaign, with one of those being a loss. In free mode, this is also counting Labyrinth Mage and Haishan, we took around 60 duels, rounding our total duels off to 100. A sheer fluke of a round number right there. Our average campaign duel duration was about 2 minutes and 28 seconds. If you multiply that together, the campaign itself was about 1 hour and 39 minutes. Much better than our last run. As for the type rankings, I will comfortably place Zombie between Dinosaur and Sea Serpent, simply due to Great Mammoth being locked all the way at Labyrinth Mage. And we're done. Hey everyone, Jono here. Thank you all so much for making it to the end of the video. The channel has hit over 10,000 subscribers during the time I was recording this run, and I have all of you amazing people to thank for that. Before I sign off, I just want to give a shout out to Tobias Shegg, TZ1PW, and Cyphate for the super thanks. Your support does not go unnoticed. Thank you so much, you guys. As we near into the last months of the year, the next video will take a little longer than normal to arrive, as work deadlines will start to close in for this year, giving me less time to work on my videos. So with that being said, be sure you subscribe and hit that bell icon to stay notified on when the next video will drop. And as always, stay awesome people. Hope you draw a Raigeki for the win, and I'll see you all next time.